a man drives a car to a place he loves. He's received a call everyone dreads. His life will not be the same again. It's just, it's, it's a total numbness, it's shock. It's, you know, I just gotta get there and I gotta get there as quickly as possible. He finds the aftermath of murder, love and betrayal. Exposing the truth behind it will require meticulous investigation and cunning. What is revealed can be very hurtful and painful for everybody involved. There's a twist to this story. A killer tricked. Covert technology the police can't even discuss on camera. Technology played a major part in solving this case. Often, it's what the killer least expects that catches them out. But there's one other element in this story, the very opposite of what the killer expected. You might call it divine intervention. Carshalton Beaches in Surrey, 13 miles due south of central London. Affluent, quietly impressive, calm. Carshalton Beaches is a very nice area on the edge of London, very right on green belt land, very much stockbroker belt, expensive houses with an extremely low crime rate. Police are seldom called there to deal with anything of note. It was a lovely place, and I think we were very fortunate to grow up there. Right, so it's sort of a tree-lined, I suppose it is, it is sort of almost sort of upper suburbia. <laughs> the Cosgrove family lived in the heart of the area. It was a very happy, large family home. I mean, there was four children, uh, grew up in that house. It was a, a nice neighbourhood. John was one of four children. He has a brother, Matthew, one sister called Carolyn, and another sister, who, for the purposes of this film, We'll call Sally. I think probably there was there was a um, quite a close bond between the four of us. Their parents, Maureen and Terence, were well on their way to becoming pillars of the community. They lived in that area for 30 years and, and she knew most people up and down the road and, and in the local area. Both were heavily involved with charities and worked at schools in Carshalton. Terence was treasurer at a girls prep school where Maureen helped out voluntarily with the finances and she was an assistant teacher at a separate Catholic girls school. As a mother, she was very supportive. Um, she'd always be there. If you had a problem, you knew you could go to mum. Um, you know, and she'd be there to pick up the pieces and to help and give the, the love and support where it was needed. Dad um, was a very sort of quiet um, person who kept himself to himself, his thoughts to himself. In the 90s, with their children grown up, Maureen and Terence were getting used to life on their own. There you go. In 2003, their daughter Sally got married, but the relationship didn't work out and she moved back in with her parents. Our story will actually, in some degree, become Sally's story, an account of dark events which befell her and the family. But first, in 2007, and out of the blue, separate tragedy struck. Terence suddenly disappeared. Mum rang me on the Saturday evening to ask if I'd heard from Dad um, because he'd gone out um, and hadn't come back. Uh, and she was slightly concerned about, you know, where he'd gone, what had happened to him. Um, wanted to see whether he'd come to, to, to see my family or whether we'd heard anything from him, which we hadn't. Next morning, with no sign of Terence, John set off in his car to try to find him while Maureen, distraught, waited at home. I told her that he'd probably, you know, just gone off for a drive to, to clear his head, not to worry, and I'm sure he'd be back fairly soon. But Terence would not be coming home. 
you know, I think we, we just missed the warning signs that he was feeling very low. We just put him down to him being a bit miserable for a couple of months. Later that day, Terence was found hanging from a tree in a park at Arundel in West Sussex. Sadly, whether we missed the warning signs or not, um, he, he took his own life. He, he hung himself. Um, and we'll, we'll never really know exactly why. To the family, it, it, I mean, obviously, it, it was an incredibly difficult time. What it did really do is it made us probably, it brought us together, or certainly the, the, the rest of the siblings, in kind of just looking after mum. The family had no way of knowing, but still darker tragedy lay ahead. It was 2007, and in the South London suburb of Carshalton Beaches, Maureen Cosgrove, aged 63, was coming to terms with the suicide of her husband, Terence, who'd been found hanging. Maureen wasn't alone. Her daughter, Sally, also lived in the family home. Not long after the death of her father, Sally struck up a friendship. Hey, how you doing? Whilst having a cigarette, she met a man who was originally from Scotland, but had been living for 11 years in Ireland. Bus doesn't stop here, you know that. Do I know you? No, my name's George. And you are? I don't know if I should be telling you that. Why? George Maben, known as Geordie to his mates, was in his early 40s, jobless, on the dole and disability benefit. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Oh, that fag looks nice. Could really do with one now. Really? He had children oh, but didn't live with them. He was living with his 82-year-old really mother at her house in North Sutton. Yeah. That'll be ever so kind of you. That became an item very quickly. Um, and, you know, one minute she was single, the next minute she's got this new boyfriend called Geordie and, and everything's great. I don't know. Oh, did you? Yeah. So you grew up around here? Yeah, collecting sticks. George Maypen immediately stood out from uh, the other members of the family. He came across as quite softly spoken, quite charming and quite uh, eager to help. I can take you away from all. You know, we've had little trips. He was not in work. And not only that, a cause of some friction between him and John in particular, uh, that he didn't seem to want to get any work. I think part of the reason that the relationship developed so quickly um, was, well, I guess from his point of view, um, she was an attractive girl who was a lot younger than he was. I think possibly the attraction was that he was paying her attention. Um, it was only a few months after our father had died. Um, you know, he, he was there to make a fuss over her and, and spoil her. You know, he obviously um, cared passionately about her and, and I think we all saw it as possibly, you know, a good thing in her life. It's not. <laughs> he was automatically included within the family unit and given the same sort of care as uh, two sons and two daughters. But within months, George was getting itchy feet. He longed to take Sally to live in Ireland. He seemed to, to love this sort of Celtic image. Late in 2007, they went. But the reality was to prove tougher than they'd hoped. Sally found work as a bookkeeper, but it soon became apparent it wasn't working out. She didn't keep that job for long. Do, do you realise the accounts after being tomorrow morning at 12 o'clock? Yes, I do. I realise that. Yeah. I understand that, that the employer got a little frustrated with the fact that, that Geordie would keep turning up. In the summer of 2008, Sally and George returned to England and moved in with Maureen. Geordie didn't want to come back. He wanted to stay out there. She wanted to come back. I guess she was probably missing her mum. Fairly quickly, though, it became clear that it wasn't ideal. Um, 
he wasn't a lot of help around the house. Um, you know, didn't work, didn't contribute financially to the household. So, you know, suddenly mum was supporting him financially. Um, he made no effort to go out and find a job. Simple things like walking through the living room with the shoes on and not taking the shoes off. Although there was a fairly minor point, it became much more of an issue to Maureen. Please, I have asked you so many times. Right, sorry. These things grew and grew. There was a summer house in the garden and Sally and George used this as a retreat, a place where they could spend time by themselves. George had never had very much. He'd uh, never even had a regular job. He'd uh, struck a little gold mine, really, um, living in a lovely house with plenty of space, with a family who had a, who were comfortably off. In the late summer of 2008, Sally became pregnant with George's child. But Maureen's patience with George was running out. Mum, I think, felt that, you know, now, now that he had the responsibility or was the responsibility of a partner and a child that was going to be born, he should probably find a job. Um, and I think the fact he didn't led to some friction. Towards the end of the year, she actually limited the time he was allowed to stay. Um, he was only allowed to stay, I think, a couple of nights a week. Um, and at that point, he actually had to go back and live with his mum. Sally decided not to move with him to his mother's house, but to stay with Maureen. Can I help? No, just leave me alone to pack. Jordy was obviously not happy that he was no longer allowed to live in the house. Oh, he wanted to be living with this, this woman that he loved and was very, very possessive over anyway and was now pregnant with his child. He was allowed to stay at the house occasionally. Maureen suggested a holiday, taking Sally and her sister. She didn't invite George, who'd created a scene on an earlier trip to Spain with the family. Well, you know what happened last time. There'd been an altercation over an attentive waiter. George got quite jealous and quite angry. Excuse me, guys. I have some more tapas for you guys. Is everything all right with your food so far? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? Wow. So, que guapa. Absolutely gorgeous. Hey! Get What's your up? hands down. Please. Come down, with a nice compliment. Just get in the kitchen. Sorry about that, yeah? Yeah? Excuse me, guys. Excuse me. I think he, he took that badly. Not that he wasn't going on holiday, I think, but the fact that she would be out of his line of sight. In the end, that holiday never happened. Events intervened and nothing would be the same again. At the family home, March the 24th, 2009, began as a perfectly ordinary day. Sally got up, did her morning chores and watched TV. George spoke to her several times on the phone. Yeah, 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 I'm good. They arranged to go shopping, then meet for lunch just off Sutton High Street. Maureen had gone out to visit the dentist, then donate some clothes to a charity shop before heading home. But as the day wore on and Sally prepared to meet George, she tried repeatedly to call her mother but received no reply. Later that day, at the offices in North Kensington in London where he worked, John Cosgrove received a phone call from his brother. And he said, you've got to get home. And I kind of said, well, why? What's the matter? And he said, oh, it's mum. I think she's dead. The call from my brother just totally numbed me. Um, it was almost like, you know, it was disbelief and I think because it was there was so much uncertainty around at that point what had happened um, it was just you know it, it, it was you know w w mum's passed away why how you know what on earth is going on 
all sorts of things were racing through my mind. My initial uh, thought was that you know she she'd had some kind of you know heart attack or, or, or you know uh, at a fall. He arrived to find part of the street sealed off. And I thought you know this this hasn't happened as a result of some sort of illness or, or, or a fall or something. There wouldn't be this level of police attendance. You know, you see that tape, you immediately think crime scene, don't you? John? I'm really sorry about your mark. I'm so sorry. It emerged George had met Sally for a drink. They'd done some shopping, then headed to Maureen's house. The accounts of George and Sally as to what happened next vary in detail. This is George's version. Fancy a brew? Coffee. Coffee for me, I think, yeah. Get in here. Yes. Maury? Maury? No. 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 Call, call an ambulance. Call an ambulance. I'll feed you it. Go on. Maureen, come on, Maureen. It's my mother. I, I think she's dead. Paramedics arrived and confirmed Maureen was dead. They called the police. I'm just going to phone the police, OK? Subconsciously, I knew that it probably wasn't death by natural causes or, 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 or fall. So I was kind of starting to think some sort of confrontational situation at that point. She's just lying here on the kitchen floor with my mum. Okay. Uh, as soon as the police arrived, it became quickly apparent that uh, Maureen had in fact been murdered. There was clear signs of strangulation. If they'd said, you know, she, she'd, been found, she, she'd been pushed over and, you know, cracked her head on the floor or something, you might think, well, that could have happened if there was a bit of a, a confrontation. But, you know, you suddenly think that your average intruder is just going to want to push her out of the way and get out of the property rather than stay there and strangle her to death, um, which just really made it even more kind of mysterious and difficult to comprehend at that point. The cause of death was confirmed as strangulation in a post-mortem the following day at St Helia Hospital. It was obvious that there had been a sustained compression of the neck using a ligature and that uh, extremely strong pressure had been used. That was the only significant injury to Maureen. It was an incredibly difficult time um, despite the, you know, the support that the, the family liaison team gave us, and I think they saw us every day. Very, very unsettling, um, very emotional. Um, you know, you go from moments of, of tearful emotion, when you, which I guess is the grief, to anger, frustration. An initial line of inquiry was that the killing was a domestic incident. There's no disturbance within the premises, there was no forced entry to the house. Uh, everything appeared in place. I had a strong suspicion this may well be linked into the family and linked into someone who either lived at the house or frequented the house. You've obviously got to be open-minded as to who may have been responsible, but you've got to be realistic as well. Someone has killed Maureen Cosgrove in a house. The chances of somebody who knows Maureen Cosgrove and who knows the house, the chances of it being some random psychotic killer who's gone to the premises is extremely low. So we had to be extremely careful about the information which was being released, even to the closest family. It was absolutely awful because we knew um, at that point that someone had taken mum's life. Um, we didn't know how. Um, you don't know whether the attack is of a, a sexual nature, you just, you've got no idea. Um, and it's just, I think it's just, it, it's, it, it's the horror of knowing that, that someone's taken her life. Um, but at the same time, you know, a great degree of, of kind of inquisitiveness because you do actually want to know what has happened. I was asked to go and see them and to explain in fairly brief terms what we would like to happen. 
Maureen's sons and daughters were subdued. The response of George was different. Certainly George, he, he wanted to know what we were going to do, how we were going to do it, how we were going to find uh, the person who killed his mother-in-law, in effect. Well, if there's anything you need from us, you know, we, we can help. OK, thanks. Thanks very much. Police did reveal to the family certain details about the attack itself. It was absolutely awful. I mean, I think, you know, in comparison that, that, that Dad had died by hanging and then to know that Mum had basically died, you know, in a similar way, but not of our own um, wish. Um, no, it's just horrible. But at the same time, um, they were able to confirm that, you know, the attack wasn't of a sexual nature and that actually was a relief. The only thing I could think of was that Mum had disturbed an intruder. George, too, speculated there'd been a burglary. He told police several doors, in addition to the patio door, had been left open, which was out of character for Maureen, who was security conscious. The one line of inquiry we did have was that this may have been a burglary. George asked Sally whether Maureen's handbag was missing. We found Maureen's coat next to her and one would expect to have found the handbag next to the coat. It was clearly missing. We worked with both Surrey Police and the local police divisions to identify patterns of burglary offending in the local geographical area. There was nothing at all that matched the circumstances that I was dealing with. A thorough forensic search of the actual house took place and at the same time we were looking for the missing handbag. We then started to conduct more thorough searches of gardens and in an adjoining garden we found Maureen's handbag which had been abandoned. The bag appeared to have been thrown across the fence near the summer house. The contents were examined and we were surprised to find there was absolutely nothing missing from the handbag. Credit cards, driving licence, substantial amount of cash were all within the handbag and purse. That made burglary seem less likely as an option. The family liaison officers were asking whether um, we could think of anybody who might have a grudge against the family, um, whether there might be sort of, I suppose, <laughs> hidden dark secrets in the family that, you know, someone might, might, might want to, to attack mum. But then the family got a shock. Police suspicions were falling close to home. I'd ask you both to accompany me to the station, please. Police investigating the murder of Maureen Cosgrove, aged 65, in the affluent South London suburb of Carsholton Beaches, had two key potential suspects. One was George Mabin, partner of Maureen's daughter, Sally. The other, to the family's alarm, was Sally herself. She and George had found the body. One of the family liaison team uh, rang and said, we are taking them both back into the police station for questioning. So when they obviously they were I think what they call like key witnesses because they found the body. But immediately I was kind of, you know, why? What have they done? As police questioned George, they noted what appeared to be a small friction burn on his forefinger. The result of the post-mortem and the confirmation a ligature had been used, I had to consider could that friction burn have been caused during the application for ligature? Um, it's nothing, just a, just a wee cut. I was moving a washing machine at my mother's so I had to sort of wedge it out. I'd just cut my finger, you know, you know, that's all. Whilst he was still at the police station, his injury being photographed, I dispatched officers up to his mother's house and they examined the washing machine. They found food debris, hair, dust, all around the washing machine and there was cobwebs almost welding the washing machine to the wall. It was quite clear the washing machine had never been moved. No wheels had been turned. 
George had lied. Police probed more deeply into the relations between him and the family. The family liaison officers uh, who are deployed to deal with the family, they're there not only to provide support, but they're also to gather information and any potential evidence. And uh, we started making discreet inquiries George. as to Maureen, her relationships with family members and associates. It was quite a consistent theme running through the accounts that there was uh, an unhappy relationship between George and Maureen. Police soon established friction had centred on George's relationship with Sally. They decided to build a detailed picture of the exact movements of the two of them on the day of the killing. It quickly became apparent to us that uh, everything she told us could be verified. She was where she said she was, she was doing what she said she was doing. On the other hand, the movements of George could not be verified. He was brought into Sutton Police Station. When George was interviewed, he was uh, very polite. He was um, quite a outgoing, gregarious person. When, when you, you know, they're waiting for you, you have to ring him, say, I'm on my way, I'm on my way. He's a bit like that, so. Very cooperative with officers. And he was seeking to give very detailed answers to all the questions that were put to him. The problem was, no one could remember seeing him at the times and places he'd specified before his meeting with Sally. By day two or three of the inquiry, I was becoming more and more unhappy with George Mabin. Uh, his account of movements was becoming less robust. The relationship wasn't good. He was coming to the fore as a suspect for me. The account given by George was that he'd been at home in the St Helier area with his mother. He'd been up by the local co-op shop. He had then caught a bus into the Sutton area, into the town centre. He said he'd waited there for Sally and had eventually met up with her. If George was lying about his movements, it was important we found out where he really was at the time in question during that morning. We needed some independent, verifiable proof of his story. George's mother was spoken to by officers from the inquiry. She's an elderly lady, and she could give no clear, reliable account of his movements. It was highly possibly taken a bus. Most of the buses have CCTV. An obvious line of inquiry was, sees all the bus CCTV in Sutton. Police started with footage from buses en routes between George's mother's house and the murder scene. The material was analyzed in this room at Sutton Police Station. And lo and behold, George was on a bus. This is George getting onto the uh, S4 bus. Uh, this route for the bus takes him up to the area where the actual offence took place. He's on the bus travelling towards Shalton Beaches some of where he said he hadn't been that day. You can see clearly he has no gloves on and blue jeans with white training shoes and he's got a distinctive hat, a brown coat. It was a nice warm day and curiously he was very much overdressed for the weather. He was wearing a hat, a heavy coat and during the course of the bus journey he started to put on a very heavy pair of gloves. his hands become visible and there's quite clearly some dark or black gloves that he's now put on while he's been sitting on the back of the bus. Now, there's obviously a reason for that. I hadn't suddenly get cold on the bus. He didn't need to warm his hands up. Very interesting why he was wearing gloves. In my mind, I had the friction pan on George's finger and the question of the heavy gloves. We made inquiries and established from the pathologist that it was quite feasible that a friction burn could be caused using a ligature whilst wearing heavy gloves. Police also checked mobile phone records, cross-referencing data from phone masts to pinpoint the position of George's phone. Hey, 
Hi, George. Hi. How are you doing? They tracked his phone from his home area all the way to Kosholten beaches. On the way, he made several calls to Sally, pretending he was at home, when actually he was very close to the murder scene. And one of them was extremely sinister in that he called up to actually check that she'd left the house and that she was on her way to him in Sutton. Have you left yet? Have you left the house? To me, that was him checking to make sure the coast was clear. George's journey took him to a bus stop near Maureen's house. This is the time about 9.53 where George crosses in front of the bus camera and walks off towards Maureen's house. This is a time when he, at first he said that he was still at his mother's address. You can see it's a very quiet street. He's the only one in there. As he disappears out of view, you just see him change direction and cross over to the side of the road where Maureen's house is. Just there, he begins to cross over and then out of sight. Analysts found evidence of one phone call which was particularly telling. It seemed George had slipped through a side gate and received a call at the bottom of the garden. All right, All right. We instructed expert engineers who were able to tell us the exact location of the phone to within a few hundred yards in some cases, but one phone call in particular was extremely relevant. As a result of a geographical anomaly, a valley some two to three miles away, they were able to pinpoint one call to the back garden. The in town. Right, good. And it was located in a space only three or four foot wide, directly behind the summer house. And that was the only space within Kersholten beaches where this particular phone mast hit. The area behind the garden shed became extremely relevant to the inquiry. This was where the handbag was located next door neighbour's garden and it's quite clear that it may have been spent some time there. It was a good hiding area. It was an area that he was familiar with. Whenever he visited the house in the past, he'd spent a lot of time there. And from the cigarette butts lying about, it was obviously an area that he used regularly to smoke. It was a simple step to theorise what happened next. It's my belief that he waited in the back garden until he saw movement in the house, Maureen having returned from the dentist. He then quite calmly walked up the back garden, knocked on the back door. Maureen would have quite readily admitted him to the house. Oh, hello. Hi. Are you in the back? Can I get a brew? And once he was in the kitchen, he attacked her and killed her. Phone records show a call was made from the house landline to George's mobile. But the mobile was in the close vicinity at the time. This was clearly an attempt by him to throw us off the scent and make us believe that someone from within the house was phoning him and trying to get in contact with him. Police believe he then threw Maureen's handbag over the fence to make it look like burglary, though neglecting to remove money or credit cards, then left to meet Sally and Sutton. But proving George was at the scene was one thing, proving murder was another. Police turned once again to CCTV. Here we see George about an hour after the murder occurred in Sutton High Street crossing the road. He crosses over towards a bin where he appears to put something in the bin. Here we see a shot from a jeweler's window where he turns away having put items in the bin where he walks to a small alcove here. And then you see him take the coat off. The coat potentially held vital evidence. He appears to kick it through underneath the gate. 
it was quite obvious to me that he was attempting to change his appearance. That court was obviously very, very important to our inquiry and it was vital that we get hold of it. Once again, CCTV provided the lead. The story was about to take a new twist, thanks to a random passerby. In this footage you see a male coming down on a bicycle. He gets off the bike and pushes it down the footway, where he goes behind the lamppost and he goes to the Lloyd's cash point. He then picks up the coat and cycles off with the coat, which is dangling over his handlebars. The bank identified the man who'd taken money from the cash point. Officers were dispatched immediately to his home address. There they spoke to him, asked him about the coat, and he was able to produce the coat, untouched, unworn, still as it was, from when he picked it up a few days earlier. Once we had actually got the coat back, it was a, you know, it wasn't a, a eureka moment in that um, it really was a significant part of the evidence. The coat was submitted to the forensic laboratory for examination, both for DNA and for fibres. The DNA was able to prove that George was a habitual wearer of that coat, and the fibres contained upon the coat showed a huge number of red fibres. These red fibres were mainly contained to the arms and the chest area, and these fibres importantly matched the top that was worn by Maureen at the time of her death. Black fibres, similar to those from the coat, were found on Maureen's top. George's account Lucy. of finding the body, Lucy, which in this respect did not match Lucy. Sally's, attempted to explain the fibres by saying he held her as she lay yeah, dead. I was keen to recover the gloves worn by George. These have never been found by place. George was asked about them. He came up with a cock and bull story, saying that his dog had eaten the gloves. It's my belief that the gloves were put into the bin, along with the ligature. Though the evidence against George was circumstantial, police were confident they had their killer. But there was one lingering possibility they had to resolve. What I was less certain of was whether he was the only person involved in it or whether he'd an accomplice. And I needed some concrete evidence to prove that one way or another. If Sally was innocent, police wanted to rule out completely the possibility she was involved. The evidence was to come from the most unexpected quarter. Police believed they'd identified the killer of 65-year-old Maureen Cosgrove at her home in Carshalton Beaches in South London. They had a strong circumstantial case against George Mabin, the partner of her daughter Sally, who was carrying his child. They wanted to confirm beyond all doubt that George had acted alone and that Sally was not involved. Their methods were covert. Police will not even discuss them on camera and produced results beyond an investigator's dreams. Their ploy began with a crucial piece of information they'd never revealed to anyone, the recovery of Maureen's handbag from behind a neighbor's fence. After the murder, they'd seized Sally's Ford Focus car for forensic examination. Now they handed it back, and just before they did so, in the hope of triggering a telling reaction, they told Sally the handbag had been found and contained evidence which could identify the killer. The contents inside give us evidence to suggest who the killer of your mother was. You know who's done it? Yeah, we have evidence. Oh, that's the best news ever. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Did you hear that, George? Oh, my God. Oh, my God, George. Did you just hear that? Hi. They think they know who's done it. I can't believe it. Oh, that's amazing news, that's amazing. What neither of them knew was that the car was bugged. Their reactions alone told police what they wanted to know. After a short time, Sally asked George to pull over so she could get some cigarettes. And it was what happened when she was out of the car that was to prove conclusive in court. God 
forgive me for what I've done. I just couldn't take it anymore. Every single day she was she was breaking me down. God. Oh, forgive me. Please God. I'm sorry. Okay, babe. You alright? Okay. okay. Yeah, 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 I'm just just a bit shocked, you know. Police confronted George with the recording. God forgive me for what I've done. Shit. I just couldn't take it anymore. George was charged with murder. Police were satisfied Sally was innocent. Her brother, John, was asked to collect her from the police station. She was just in floods of tears. Um, they took me into an interview room to, to see her and she was just floods of tears saying, you know, she, it, it was all wrong, they got it all wrong, it couldn't be him, um, you know, can't I do anything about it, can I tell them, you know, and it, 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 it's stupid and what are they doing? It's all wrong, they've got it all wrong, can you tell them something, can you tell them they've got it all wrong? Just felt so sorry for her at that point because, you know, the, the person that had been charged was her partner. Um, and the father of the baby she was carrying. And, um, you know, despite the fact that she was convinced he hadn't done it and that they got it all wrong, um, deep down you know that the chances are that he probably has. From my point of view, as much as it was horrible to think that, you know, someone that, that had been welcomed into the family and to a large extent treated as a member of the family um, could do that, um, but at the same time, there was a kind of relief that we were starting to get an answer. George refused to let Sally go and kept sending her love letters from prison whilst he was awaiting trial. He was constantly telling her, you know, he loved her, all the reasons why it wasn't him, and that basically um, the police just needed to, to make up the, you know, the, the numbers they needed to be seen to get a quick result. In October 2009, George's trial opened at the Old Bailey. In court, in the presence of the judge and jury, George came across as very meek, very mild, very polite. There was a different side to him when the jury was out of court and the judge was out of hearing. He was cocky, rude and arrogant. George attempted to explain his confession by saying his mother had been wearing him down in arguments over his dog and he wanted forgiveness for stealing 50 pounds from her purse. He claimed that he had no money on him at all. We were able to prove that that was a lie. Not only did he have money on him, we also had a receipt from a bank ATM where he'd taken £40 out on the morning of the murder. George was found guilty, but his sentence proved controversial. Judge Roberts jailed him for a minimum of 13 years, two years less than the normal tariff for premeditated murder, and seven years less than the police were expecting. On the grounds the crime was out of character, and George had been under enormous pressure and could see no other way to be with the woman he loved. The judge said that this was illustrated by the prayer for forgiveness recorded by police. No sentence would have been enough, but 13 just wasn't enough for what he'd done, you know, what he'd done to my mum and what it had done to our family. I consulted with the County Prosecution Service and with the QC who presented the case in court. An appeal was made to the High Court and the sentence was increased quite rightly to 18 years. George had clearly put some planning and thought into the commission of this murder. This wasn't a spur of the moment thing. It was something he'd thought about. He'd told lies before it. He'd told lies about his journey. He had the gloves in his possession. One of my officers best summed up his efforts to cover up the crime as saying, you watch CSI, but you only watched half the episode. Sally and the other members of Maureen's family are now rebuilding their lives, trying to move on from tragedy. The last time I saw Mum uh, was the evening of, of Mother's Day. I went round in the evening um, took some flowers and a card, 
um, you know, gave her a hug, um, sat and chatted to her. I do remember as I went out the front door, she followed me out, she gave me a hug, said thank you for the flowers, love you, speak to you later. And I got my car and drove off. That's the last time I saw her. Well, last time I saw her alive anyway.